Today, we'll be speaking with Phil McGraw, also known as Dr. Phil, host of Dr. Phil Primetime on Merritt Street Media and author of the new book, We've Got Issues, How You Can Stand Strong for America's Soul and Sanity. You know, I'm very interested to speak to you today because in preparation for our interview, I've been watching some of the Fox News appearances, looking at the book, et cetera. I never really saw you as a guy who delved into political issues per se. You seem more willing, interested, and I must say maybe more conservative than I thought you were. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, not at all. OK, uh, because I am I am so not political. You can't even believe it. And I'll tell you why. I know nothing about politics. And, yeah. uh, and I know why you say that. It sounds like it. Right. I talk about these things as cultural issues in from a psychological, so, psychosocial standpoint, how they affect families and people. And they do overlap with some of the things that politicians talk about. But they talk about it from uh, a political standpoint, funding standpoint, how they can get this bill or that bill through. Couldn't yeah. care less. But I am interested in those issues in terms of how they impact families in their day to day pursuit of life and and peace and being able to raise their family in a healthy environment. So there's a lot of overlap, but I don't talk about it from a political standpoint because I frankly don't know enough about the politics of it all. That's I'm interesting. just willing to admit that. I'm just willing and, you to know, admit it. I, I don't think a lot of other people know either. I'm just willing to admit it. I don't want to make this like, you know, famously, there's a story of um, uh, liter literary critics were talking about the symbolism in Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, and he would tell them, that's not at all what I meant. And so I don't yeah. want to make this where I tell you about how political all the stuff you say is. But the reason why I say it is a lot of the language in the book and, and when you talk about issues like immigration and culture and others, it seems as though it alludes to going back to the good old days, uh, individual decisions in the style that many Republicans now talk about with regard to schooling and parenting, et cetera. But you're selling, saying it's just not the case. No, and that doesn't mean that there aren't politicians on both sides of the aisle um, that talk about these issues. But if you really think about raising a family in America, whether it's now or 50 years ago or 20 years down the road, we still have to keep our eye on what I think are core issues in America. And I think the backbone of America is the family unit. I really think that if we have strong families, if we have strong family values, and I think that our families in America, as you've heard me say and, and read me say, are under attack. And I think some of those attacks are unintended consequences of technology, for example. Um, but these are things that whether politicians talked about them or not, if they tried to legislate about them or not, I would still be talking about. So um, talk about give some examples of that. What are some of the attacks facing families? Well, I think about 08, 09, uh, we had what I think has been the biggest change uh, to human life since the Industrial Revolution. I think before the Industrial Revolution, we were a very agricultural uh, civilization, right? People worked on the farms. We grew mm -hmm. what we needed. But then we became mechanized. And I think back then we were 95% uh, agricultural. Now we're 1% uh, agricultural. Why? Because uh, everything is so mechanized and people move to the cities and all. Well, the biggest thing that's happened since then, in my opinion, was the advent of the smartphone. Mm -hmm. uh, the Internet became so prolific. And I mean, think about it. We're walking around in 08, 09 with as much computing power in our hands with smartphones, laptops, iPads. Uh, that we had when we did the moonshot. When we put a man on the moon, we didn't have as much computing power as we can hold in our hands as of 08, 09, and it changed everything. And people stopped being 
uh, so involved with the reality of life and started getting involved in virtual life. And it's only gone more and more in that direction since that time. And also at that time, yeah. we started seeing the highest levels of anxiety, depression, and loneliness in young people since records were kept. And I'm with you on this changed. one. I'm with you on this one. Jonathan Haidt has studied and written about this extensively. You and I are aligned on this one. What yeah. about the ones that fall under what you call the tyranny of the fringe? Because I don't think the smartphone example falls under that category, right? No, that's why I say some of this is the unintended consequences of like technology. But yeah. then we've got uh, some where we've got people that are just trying to change uh, some of the core values in America, core values of family trying okay. to rewrite history. Uh, and we, we've got people that are coming in saying, well, we want to change history. We want to change what kids are being taught in history. We want to change biology. We want to change uh, all of the things that we have for a hundred years uh, had empirical data to support. But tell me more, uh, about, I don't want to change. gloss over this. I, I want, really want to understand this. Changing history. OK, what what was the history that used to be taught that now has been changed by the tyranny of the fringe? Well, I, you know, pick an area. We can talk about biology where we have always had two sexes. But what about but history? Now, Just to pick history, not biology, because you said history, biology. What about history? Well, there's a lot of history to biology, and you would be missing a big point to pretend that there's not historical biology. Uh, but if you want to talk about history, we can uh, not in biology, but just talk about the history of mankind. Yeah, we've got areas where they don't want to talk about slavery. We we had one. Uh, a group of people that wanted to start describing slavery in history books is involuntary relocation. Right. This was not involuntary relocation. This was slavery. And we've got people that are wanting to rename schools because people that were doing what were the mores and folkways of the times now would clearly uh, be doing things against the law, certainly against mores and folkways, because they were slave owners at the time, uh, are saying, well, now we have to tear down these statues, we have to rename these schools, and we don't want to teach about them. We have to learn from our mistakes as a society. We can't pretend those things didn't happen. They did happen. They were dark and ugly times in American history, we don't want to pretend those things weren't there. So let that, me see if that, I understand, crazy. because there's a bunch of stuff. So if I hear you correctly, you're not in agreement with those who want to minimize the tragedy and brutality of slavery, but you also want to keep the school names. If a school is named after a slave owner, you're also OK with that because it will remind us and we will learn from it. Am I understanding that correctly? I think you're oversimplifying what I'm saying. What okay. I'm saying is if you're wanting to change American history to pretend that these people did not exist and you want to measure them by today's yardstick rather than the yardstick at the time, that's what is referred to as presentism. And that's like saying, OK, you're going to drive through a neighborhood and the speed limit is 20. And you drive through that neighborhood doing 20. And then they come along and say, you know what? We're going to change the speed limit to 10. And we're going to give you a ticket for speeding when the speed limit uh, was 20. Mm. It's now 10. But you weren't speeding when you were doing 20, but now it's 10. We're going to give you a retroactive ticket for doing what was acceptable at the time. That's called presentism. We're going to take what was done back at the time, pull it up into the current time, 
and condemn you for not knowing what was going to be acceptable 200 years later mm. than when you did it. And I think that is really narcissistic and arrogant and rewriting history instead of letting people learn from the mistakes that mis were made in America and that we need to learn from so we don't make those mistakes again. Because some of those people also did some really good things at the time. Mm. We don't need to endorse everything they did, but we need to acknowledge the good and the bad. When it comes to cancel culture, something you've also written and spoken about, what do you think is the prototypical or emblematic example of someone who was unfairly canceled over the last few years? Well, I think the idea of cancel culture is more than one person, and I'm not going to speak specifically about one person. What I'm going to say <laughs> is you've got people that want their speech instead of free speech. And so they will come in and talk about in a university uh, certain things that can't be shared, can't be talked about. We've got universities that have put out uh, language that they highly recommend their professors to not use. One of them that jumps out at me from the University of California is they were encouraged to no longer say America is the land of opportunity or the job should go to the most qualified person. I'm saying you can't say those things anymore because they um, are considered to be oppressive. Mm. And if you have university faculty, even tenured faculty, uh, that talk about those things or ask their students to take positions that are contrary uh, to what they believe, what the students believe, they get grieved against, they get suspended, they get disciplined, uh, and in a sense, canceled at that You know, point. that's interesting. Let, let me weigh in on that a little bit, because that's very interesting. You know, in preparation for the interview, I looked at the academic setting, because a lot of times when we talk about cancellation, we talk about, oh, a comedian who said or did something, and then for a while they didn't have shows or something like that, you know, Louis C.K., for example, et cetera. I looked for the revocation of tenure for professors in a lot of these schools that you talk about or allude to. And really, it seems that when tenure is being stripped, it's for real wrongdoing. Plagiarism is uncovered, sexual harassment of students, et cetera. I really struggle to find evidence in a country of 330 million people of tenure being stripped just because of using the wrong language. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't wacky memos that go out or I, I'm with you that this stuff exists anecdotally. But if we think about what is happening big picture, I actually struggle to really find examples of this as an epidemic. Tell, tell me where I may be missing something. Well, I don't know what you mean by epidemic. Well, that it's happening that that professors are being stripped of tenure, not for serious violations of their uh, you know, like I said, sexual harassment, plagiarism, being uh, uh, involved in criminality, but just because they said something that is maybe not politically correct. I'm just not seeing that tenure is being stripped from professors for that. Do you have any examples of professors that have lost tenure in that way? Uh, I do, and I'll provide it to you. How's that? I'll get you a list and send it to you. That would be I would love to do that, because if that is happening, uh, I want to expose that and I want to talk about that. A um, couple other things that I wanted to ask you about when it comes to what you see happening in the political space right now, approaching it from a cultural perspective, as you say that you do. Do you agree that a decline in religiosity is a problem in the United States or is that not a concern to you? Uh, it is a concern to me. I think we've seen. Um Church membership dropped below the 50 percent mark mm -hmm. um, for the first time in our country's history. And I think that that's a problem for a variety of reasons. And 
one of them being that that's one of the times that families tend to spend quality time together. Mm. Uh, it's time that they put their phones down. It's time that they um, usually got together um, and would go do something as a unit and focus on values that were constructive to the family. Uh, there was often meditation time involved. There was often discussions about what was discussed in church that day. Uh, they often had Sunday dinner together afterwards and spent quality time like they did no other time during the day. And I think it also is a product of our, lesson, um, our lessened uh, birth rate, which is dropped because a lot of people join church uh, when they have children because they want their child to be baptized or christened hmm. or whatever. And the fact that we've seen our birth rate drop to around 1.6 uh, from 2.1, which is necessary to sustain yes. um, our infrastructure right now, uh, is a problem, and it seems that that's one of the main reasons that church membership has dropped off. There's fewer kids to go get baptized, christened, or whatever, uh, so people have less reason to go to church, and that's a byproduct of the le of the of the lesser birth rate. What do you make of the correlation, anyway, that as church attendance has declined, which you rightly point out, the rate of violent crime and murder in the United States has also been declining. Do you, do you think there's anything in because a lot of times the claim is made that as you remove God, whether it's from school or whatever, bad things happen, crime rates go up, et cetera. But we continue to see violent crime rates decline in the United States, correlating with decreased church attendance. What do you make of that? Well, I think that um that, that is a correlation, and I think some crime is declining in some areas and it's going up in others. But I think the idea is that if we will work to consequate crime, put some uh, measure of uh, consequence that goes with the crimes that are happening uh, and give these people uh, some result for what they do and give them some opportunity uh, to turn their life around, learn how to do things differently uh, than what they're doing, uh, then we'll see it continue to decline in the areas where uh, we've got good trends and turn, turn it around in areas where we don't. But what I think is most important, uh, particularly among our young people, uh, is that we make sure that our parents are involved in our kids' lives so they don't get started in even misdemeanor crime right now. That's shoplifting, for sure. Shoplifting is up, and uh, these are misdemeanors, a lot of which don't get prosecuted. Uh, and you wonder, a lot of this is happening with young kids, and I, I fear they're getting exploited by gangs, and you wonder, where are their parents? Mm -hmm. uh, if if they are vulnerable to gangs using them to go do shoplifting, uh, which you know annually is over a hundred billion dollars a year uh, in terms of overall loss and shrinkage from corporations, uh, then you, you know somebody's doing that, and a lot of it is organized crime, and they're exploiting young people to do it because they know there's not a lot of consequence for it. Mm. And you got to wonder, where are their parents? Um, do they know what they're doing? Are they talking to them about this? Are they discussing it with them so that they don't get caught up in that? And that's not a violent crime most of the time, um, but it's still a crime and it speaks to the values that they're holding or not holding. Uh, I know that we're uh, at the end of our time and I don't want to keep you over. I'll remind the audience, the new book is We've Got Issues, How You Can Stand Strong for America's Soul and Sanity. I really appreciate your time and insights and being totally transparent, having never spoken to you before. A lot of what you're saying sounds very conservative to me, which doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. I happen not to be a conservative. Some in our audience are. That's my read of it all. And I think it's very interesting to see you wading into some of these topics. 
And don't forget that I said I was going to send you a list of yes. professors that have had consequences, and I expect you to share that with your listeners when I do. We will include it in the YouTube description. You have my promise, sir. All right. And you have my promise. I'll send it to you. All right. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much. I'm glad we were able to make this work.